Hello and welcome to this week's Macker to Macker. It's really wonderful to be here again in my very own living room. <laughs> and wonderful that you've come along to, if this is your very first time uh, to Macker to Macker, a very warm welcome to you. And if you've been more than once, an even warmer welcome to you. The term Macker is the Scottish word for national poet. And at the moment, that's me. I'm the third modern Macker. I follow Liz Lockhead and Edwin Morgan. Had Edwin lived, he would have been 100 on the 27th of April this year, which seems kind of incredible to me. The idea behind this series is that we pass the baton on Macker to Macker, Maker to Maker, which I guess is the nearest English equivalent of the word Macker, the old Scots word for bard, but Chaucer used to be referred to as a Macker by Dunbar. So it's not a word that's used exclusively for Scottish poets at all. And in this series, we're going to have a whole mixture of people that are passionate about poetry and writing in one way and another. On tonight's show, we've got the wonderful, the absolutely fabulous Padraig Mackay. We've got the absolutely fantastic singer back with us. We've got the fantastic singer back with us, Suzanne Bonner. And I don't know how many of you have seen the other couple of Mackers, um, Macker to Mackers with Suzanne on it, but they were absolutely a complete sensation. And for the first time, we have a prose writer. Woo! <laughs> We've got a short story writer, Chris McQueer, um, who's been building up an incredible following as well. So we're in for a treat tonight, a really, really lovely combination. And I always kick things off with a wee poem of my own. And this poem's called Yell Sound. And I imagine the speaker of the poem to be um, an old woman living on Yell. I always looked out at the world and wondered if the world looked back at me, standing on the edge of something, on my face, the wind from the cold sea. Across the water were mirrors to see, faces that looked like me, people caught between two places, people crossing over the seas. And it seemed from my croft with the old stones and the sheep and the sound of the songs in my sleep, that the music of folk somewhere meets on the edge of the place we might be. I've lived through some hard times. My body is lined, my face so frail. I used to think I might be able when the river ran to meet the sea, when the sun and moon shared the sky, to look out as far as the eye could see and raise a glass to the girl looking back at me. Well, I would like you now to welcome into the Zoom room all three of our wonderful people, Suzanne Bonner. Hello, Suzanne. Hello. <laughs> Padraig Mackay. Hi there, Jackie. Hi there. And Chris, hi. Hi, Chris McQueer. How are you doing? <laughs> hi, do, doing great. Doing great. So it's really lovely to, to see you all in the Zoom room. And isn't it funny, these wee things that we've developed now, um, to go with our digital selves, you know, little waves to each other. <laughs> as, if it made it all, as if it made it all more personable somehow on the screen. <laughs> so I'm just giving you a wee one. Uh, hello. And anyone to Macker to Macker. And, and uh, yeah, every week I just like repeating that because it's, it's fun for me. <laughs> I guess because part of me still can't quite believe that I'm the Macker. Anyway, we're, we're, um, I'm really delighted that, that Suzanne Bonner is here again. She's, she's a really wonderful singer. She first broke onto the scene with the wittily titled documentary, Fly Me to Danoon. And she then did another documentary a few years later, The Blacksbird Connection, which won a Celtic Award and a New York Times Award, Film Award. And... Um, really, really made a huge impression about with people. It told the story really of her reconnecting with her father and finding this whole family in South Carolina that she didn't know about and it was tremendously moving. And I, that was my first encounter with Suzanne was to, was to watch that and to watch Fly Me to Danoon. So it's funny, Suzanne, because we actually met, or for me anyway, we met on screen. And, uh, and that's, that's a strange thing. And, and we're now actually really firm friends, aren't we? 
You certainly <laughs> are. <laughs> <laughs> we are <laughs> it's been a delight joyous years <laughs> and you're going to sing tonight uh, a gaelic song aren't you for Patrick? i am yes uh, san anila <laughs> okay well just yeah just take it away okay. <laughs> San Nila 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 San Nila Rugmi San Nila 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 San Nila Voyok San Nila 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 San Nila Rugmi San Nila 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 San Nila Voyok San Nila Gormanyot Arukyot Mi Sawaget Mi San Nila Gormanyot Arukyot Mi Sawami San Nila Gormanyot Arukyot Mi Sawaget Mi San Nila Gormanyot Arukyot Mi Sawami Sauna <laughs> Sauna <laughs> Nura vame aunani, ala kachina kaurum. Sauna nila nila nila, sauna nila rugati. Sauna nila nila nila, sauna nila vayok. Sauna nila nila nila, sauna nila rugati. Sauna nila nila nila, sauna nila vayok. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. And tell us why you picked that song, Sudan. It was the first. Gaelic song that um, I was taught. I was in a show at the tramway and there was a choir from Namibia by the late um, great Rosina Bonsu. She'd organised a community show and um, so she brought in a woman called Mari um, who taught us a couple of Gaelic songs and that was the first one that um, she taught us so it, it stayed with me. So I was trying to go through my old um, memory bank. <laughs> <laughs> to bring all the <laughs> all the words to the <laughs> to the fore, and uh, it's an old walking song, and I love the old the walking and the rhythm and um, about islands, and also uh, having a look at Peter's work about land and and people and how we carry that with us. We carry traditions and um, that history with us, and and so I just thought it'd be really nice to to tap into that kind of genre to do this week. It's it's really 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 lovely, wasn't it, Patrick? The idea that you carry tradition with you is really at the heart of your work. That's what you you, you write about these clashes of traditions in the old world and the new. So how is that hearing that Isla Isla song? It was absolutely fantastic. It's almost impossible not to start moving when you've got a walking song like that, and different parts of your your elbows go in weird ways. <laughs> um, but there's something lovely about that song as well, Sauna Nila, where you've got these really deep bits and it's like the, the sea hitting against a gyo or a gyo and there's this mm. faraway rumble and that just came across fantastically. Oh, thank yeah, I love you. that, the idea of the, the faraway rumble because cause in a sense, you know, when, when we're connected to poetry and song, that's what we're, we're trying to tap into, a, a kind of a call in a sense from... Our, our ancestors in some way, um, but also to the land, the land itself, the faraway rumble of the land. These echoes that you don't know you're going to hear when you start listening to a song or start reading a poem and these echoes that come through from history, from other people, from places, and just these sounds and the emotions that can be contained in sounds rather than in words. It's, it's what music's for, it's fantastic. That's great. How did you like it, Chris, that song? That was brilliant. I loved that. That was really good. That was the same, same as like Peter says. Like I was just felt myself going when I was listening to it. It's lovely. It was really, really amazing. Yeah, I, I was ready to do a proper dance, you know, right across the living yeah. room floor. I'm a bit connected here. <laughs> but you need your Harris. 
you need your hardest tweet. Did you learn any Gaelic songs, Chris? No, no I'm quite ashamed. I, 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 don't, I can't speak any Gaelic. Um, uh, but it's something that's interested me because I write a lot in, in Scots. Um, and I've kind of started like, digging into the language, the language of Scots. And it feels, feels like I should be kind of pushing myself to learn a wee bit of Gaelic as well, at least a wee bit. Oh, you might, you might do. You're young. You're only in your twenties. <laughs> but, but Patrick, I think you're going to, uh, to kick. You notice that, that Suzanne's calling him Peter, and I'm, I'm calling you Patrick. Oh. <laughs> and that's because to some people you're Peter, and to other people you're Patrick, depending on whether they're speaking to you in Gaelic or English. And that already means that you've got a sense of a dualness, a duality to you, a dual identity that you, you switch between the two very easily. So I wonder if you could kick us off with your your first really brilliant poem that I just absolutely loved because it took me back to the way in which we cherish language and the way that language is partly hidden for us and we have to take out a tin and open it up again. Um, happily, I think one of the interesting things that having the dual identity, it just makes, well, it makes me pretend I'm a bit more interesting than I am. But there should <laughs> nev never be a matter of shame about languages because I think everybody's always searching for languages that you can never quite speak perfectly in a way that is on the tip of your tongue, these lost words. So that's sort of about uh, the, the basis for this poem. Nthine. Nirvami Savunskol, Hurmi Tinya Shlevintane, Frankurin Mach, and Scrive, Triscothi, and Piper. Hanyal Kainak and Enochach, Erkadre Sava Uskluck and Anamurin, is Gniver and Alima Machas Marvath and Alien. Ear Golval of Machanan, Snav Gushiri Gadaki Hyaj, Nam Hyon and Tinur Nurkig, Skachij Usk and Vrishik Sayaj. And this is an English language version which was done by um, the late great Kieran Carson. The Tin. When I was in primary school, I got myself this little flat tin where I'd stash my words writ on splinters of paper. What I remember is not the design, but how difficult it was to open without names and deeds leaping out like salmon from a net. The dumb babble of my languages, swimming forever towards their lost ground. The tin in my head rusting not to be opened without breaking its crust of salt. And one of the interesting things for me about these last um, three months, the, the very strange experience of lockdown is the attempt or the need to try and not just connect with your own past, but connect with your loved ones, with your family and friends um, at a remote distance. But of course, this is the experience for so many of us in a way. Um, I left Lewis when I was um, 17 years old and there's the, the weekly rituals of the phone calls to my mother and my father and the, the, these ongoing connections when technology now becomes your friend and um, technology allows you to create forms of community at a distance, but it also reminds you of the types of community that you don't have, the types of intimacy and immediacy that you have only in presence. And I know that Jackie's a huge fan of violence and one of the things that interests me about islands is the way that you are connected at a slight remove from people across land or across sea and you can see these lives happening so close to you but also slightly at a distance. Common. Hamavahar er fala fan an hips. Is a fe me kafona garash er vobile. Han javan ye er fiuk loish agus kitavai ki shu goma vail khoman yachtris na lunch and chiol ki. Inish can nearly eat your torch first amigo. Scavor nakil nika fek in a kinunyak, a cat in a snai and doroch a tor of savava, a brek of the warm and hoid can try, seen a toast shuk hum as ho, seen a torch can slaughter in a long riga tree, harp on trushal, some of the hall. Common. My mother is gone in a hips and has to call back on her mobile. There's a power cut all across Lewis, and though she'd been in the middle of the common yachtry's funeral lunches, now I barely have her attention, and can almost see her at the window ledge watching unpickable threads of dark pattern the village's long black drip to the sea, silent except for 
hums and haws, as torches and paraffin lamps flit twos and threes across Bowen Thrushall and Mulligan Thall. When I left Lewis, I went and lived in Glasgow um, and was a student there in the city, and I loved Glasgow. Glasgow's a great city. Largely because it does what cities should do. It's got a centre and it's got this 19th century grid pattern. It's got high, high buildings and you can get lost, as I often did, and you can get into misadventures. But I was 17. I'd played a lot of computer games. And for some reason, Glasgow reminded me more than anything else of the, the computer game Pac-Man. And the grid pattern of the city became the, the maze through which Pac-Man would, would roam. And I never quite understood um, why this was the case or what this might mean, so I wrote a poem about it. Pac-Man. Stoch gunro mieri haul, nat at the fact down at the nation, rutgen faustian, ons nro n le feher achkes and achkets, and as vice versa. At the hook mieri of kata fein kavakat mun uckle, and as kehu. From a yol horse mar haivik a Fanner buck buye spashed to strat and the freezing, so fat and grid and live lean jig. A fehu, or shun jicker or two, shun error message. Pacman. Looking back, I suppose there was, after all, some kind of pact between you and the ghosts, something Faustian in which their half life was yours and vice versa. I never understood, though, the point you were making about fear and consumption, but knew you as an ultimate urbanite, a little yellow fanar sauntering the streets of your 19th century grid pattern prison, waiting for the moment you would freeze for an error message. Uh I really, I really love those those poems, Patrick. I loved hearing hearing the Gaelic and I just find the, the, the range of you fascinating, the range of your, your interests and what you do, because of course you're, you're a broadcaster, you teach at the University of St Andrews, you've, you've taught at the Seamus Heaney uh, Poetry Centre, you've, you've taught in the, in the Highlands, at the, at the Highland and Island, Island Gaelic College there. Um, you're, you're, used, you're a well-known voice uh, on the radio, and you move between all of these different forms. With, it seems to me, exquisite ease and your new book some kind of uh was out in april uh this year so these, these three poems that you kicked us off with actually made me think really directly about the past and the present and the way that the past impacts the present the wonderful one with 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 the mother on the mobile phone and the funeral and this kind of hebridean culture of funerals and cloths it was almost like there was a there was a weaving between the two things between the the mobile phone on the one hand and the Hebridean tradition of funerals on the other. I, I think I'm really interested in the way that, well, we're all alive in a modern world, but we carry with us these long threads of different types of history, different types of tradition. And part of what we have to do is make sense of these, make sense of how these things can be woven together in new, interesting ways. Um, and one of the things that Lewis does very well um, is, is death is funeral, is commemoration, um, is the actual giving the care and attention to, to the dead as well as the living, um, which in some ways is um, quite different to the digital electronic age in which we live in. Though we are of, of now a generation where almost all of us will have um, audio recordings of loved ones. And I think there's this strange relationship between having the the disembodied voice that we can listen into um, and the absence of that person. And I'm not entirely sure that we've come to terms with this and quite what this means for us, having this simultaneous access, but but um, absence of, of dead loved ones. And it's interesting. It will be interesting, I think, over the over the coming decades and centuries, quite if that changes the relationship between the living and the dead in different ways, or the different ways in which you include voices from the past in everyday rituals or patterns or um, lunches. Yeah, or lunches exactly. And then the the first poem that you read with the tin the tin box, um, which is 
really extraordinary. It reminded me of an old uh, Kit Wright poetry exercise where you used to call it the, the magic box, where you had to open, the, you had to write your magic box and what you would put in it. But in your tin box, there's all this, this language. Um, and it made me think, do, is your relationship with your childhood language very different to it is now? Do you feel that there are certain words that take you right back to being a boy or do you feel really connected to it because you're still writing in that language? I, I think there's an, an important schism. And so, um, like many people of my age, when I went to, before I went to school, I spoke in Gaelic. It was my primary language. I was bilingual, but Gaelic was day-to-day -day language. At primary school, it was almost entirely in English. And so there is part of me that has this sense of a lost first language or, a, or of this part of my brain that might have access to all of these words and images in a level of fluency or a level of um, accuracy that I can only dream of in some ways. But that poem was, was literal. Um, my mother found the little tobacco tin that I had in primary school, which I kind of remembered having these incredibly difficult words in. But when you, she opened up, there were still the bits of paper with words like apple or car, things that I was meant to learn how to spell. So it wasn't anywhere near as elaborate or as mystical as the poem might make out. <laughs> oh, no. but I love the, I love the idea of that, and I love the idea that it was an actual actual tin as well. Because there's nothing better, really, is there, than a metaphor that's also an actual thing, an actual commodity, something that you could hold. There, there's something about those kind of metaphors that, that they they feel very authentic when they're used in a poem. You can almost I, I thought it would be a literal tin, and you can almost get to the truth of it. You feel that you're getting to some truth in the poem. I think if you've got the sense that you're actually touching something real, something in the world that is not just a fancy, then the poem does something different. And I think I, I'm really interested in um, tactility, what it means to be touching things rather than just seeing them and being able to hold um, objects in your hand and how you react in different ways to them. There's a great book by a, a writer, Santana Dash, about the First World War and objects from the trenches and what it means now to be holding them in your hands and trying to think back to, to um, 100 years ago and those experiences. Exactly, and so many people are having that experience right now because so many people are going through bereavement in all sorts of different ways and finding the connection through things back to their, their loved ones, that there are these strange roots that take us back to people. And your poems often have ideas of maps or roots are being taken back somewhere like the last poem uh, you read was completely different and contrasted with, with, with the others but that that idea of, of a kind of 1970s computer game and the 19th century uh, grid pattern of Glasgow streets having something akin to each other but still even in that poem there's a ghost there in the form of the little, little yellow figure that appears in that game and I love the, the, the contrast between that, it's like a kind of, it, it's like a shock. It's, it's a shock of the new with the old. And I think in our world all the time, we're having to do that. We're having to get this shock of the strange new with the, with the old ways and try and fashion a different way in between. And I think there's two things. The, the, the theoretical part of me that works at a university would like to say, oh, it's really interesting to explore ideas of being haunted and how the, the past is layered in the present and how the, the past will erupt out of things and shock you and surprise you. But this is emotionally very difficult because, as, as you say, there are so many people, this is not an easy time. There, there's so much bereavement, there's so much grief. And grief leaves these long, long threads as well through through the rest of your life and grief will be something that comes back and opens itself up again and again and again and it's the, the question of how you map your present and your past in ways that allow you to um to to cope with the past and allow you to to honor and respect it while living in the present i think that's really beautifully put that's going to stay with me the idea of these long threads so i might make them long lewis threads so i remember being in in lewis a year before last coming from harrison and into lewis and really being um, amazed at the contrast between and uh, the two islands that you could have them slap bang next to each other and yet they'd be so 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 different um harris having this almost kind of otherworldliness and and lewis having everything that lewis has but i remember finding it just utterly 
utterly fascinating. Um, I, you know, just just loved it, and it's so visually rich and inside my own head. Just 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 the whole place and the and the past and the way that the past is in the stones and the way you visit the stones and you become you almost become part of the of the landscape while you're there you can it's, you're only a skip and a jump away i think islands are particularly good when there are other islands and um, when they're not alone when there's an archipelago and when you can see how differences coexist right beside each other that there's nothing i love more than having land and then sea then land and looking across to another land mass and there's all, all of the multiplicity of the world is possible there there's variousness there's variety rather than just thinking about yourself as isolated and having an archipelago it means all of a sudden you're thinking okay they do something slightly different over there even if it's just across a river in harris mm -hmm. but that's okay yeah exactly <laughs> Yes, yeah. Well, we're yeah, we're we're all different in some kind of way, and that's that's what's great about islands because people are always noticed. Everybody notices everything, and um, well, that's it. That that can be their downfall too, because sometimes people don't want to be noticed for for everything. But this brings me to the to the to the point of introducing or back into the Zoom room, Chris McQueer. Oh, hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. And uh, I'm really um, excited that, that you're that you're here. And it seems to me that you present also amongst many other things. Uh, just a really wonderful contrast with with you and Pedrick because you first actually became known because you broke onto the scene with your stories on Twitter. You didn't tell your friends or your family that you were a writer, so you were kind of a secret writer. And then those stories took off, and then you got published, and and then and they took they took off even more and now you have this kind of very very large following but you're actually in the process of, of writing a novel hermit so i find that really an interesting way into the whole world of of, of writing and uh, i'd love you to because because we're talking earlier with with uh, patrick about the tradition and the past and the present and it seems to me that that, that your work opens all of that up i am um... When I was kind of growing up, like I would always, I would always sit, and it was always like me and like my granny and granda and their kind of brothers and sisters, and uh, I was like kind of the youngest in the family at that time. So I would just sit and I would listen to them all, and whenever they would have a drink, they would just all tell all these stories, and it was amazing. I just, I would just get totally caught up in it, and I was just, I was fascinated by the way they would, they would tell the stories, and it was just, it was so beautiful the way they would structure them, and they always landed on a punchline perfectly, and everybody would be laughing. Even though I didn't get the joke a lot at the time, I was still I was still howling away, um, and I was always a big reader as well, thanks to my gran. And um, I don't know, there was always a wee voice in my head that said, you know, you should try writing, you should you should try and do something about it. And um, I just didn't for some reason. It took me so long, and then but I always wanted to be a writer. I just didn't write anything. I think it's the same for a lot of people. And then I think I got to I was like twenty four. And I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a go. I'm going to see what happens. And I sat down. And I wrote a wee short story, and it was it was it was quite weird. It was about a moth, and uh, I showed it to my mum, and she was like, "What are you doing writing stories?" And she was kind of laughing, and then she read it, and she was like, "Oh, that's quite. That's really good. That's quite funny. You should put it online and try and get your pals to read it." Um, so I did, and then it just all kind of kicked off from there. I just I didn't. I was quite funny. It took me a while to build up the confidence to put it online and actually tell people that I was I was writing and that that was my actual dream was to be an author but um eventually I just I just leaned right in there and, and went for it and I just thought you know I'm not going to let anybody tell me I can't do this because it's what I want to do so I'm just going to do it and I'm can, that I managed to get. <laughs> oh fantastic so I think you're going to read for the for the first for your first set as if you like um an extract from your novel that you're working on right now, Hermit. Mm -hmm. Aye, so um, this is the wee first chapter uh, for my novel. It's on my phone, I'm just getting up. Um, so you uh, take it away, Chris. All right, thanks very much, Jackie. Um, aye, so this is the wee, the wee first chapter in my, my novel that I'm working on. It's called Hermit. And um, it's about a kind of, it's about a single mother and her son, and her son is a hermit, and it's about a kind of, um, a kind of strange, strained relationship because of it, and then so a lot of the book kind of looks at uh, the boy's childhood, 
um, and how he misremembers things and how that's affected his life just now. We things that his mum said that she thought were kind of inconsequential have really stuck with him. Um, and just other wee things. It's just a wee, wee kind of exploration of like childhood and how we all remember things differently. Um, this, this is the wee first chapter of Hermit. <clears throat> she does not love me, I said, not even looking up from my Game Boy. I was maybe six years old, I think, sitting in my granny's living room. My ma and my granny immediately stopped the conversation they were having, and I could tell they were staring at me. What? Snapped my granny. I glanced up. Huh? I nodded at my ma. She does not love me. My ma was laughing, nervously maybe, now that I look back on it. I had a, she said, looking to me and then my granny, who was all worked up. What's he saying that for? My granny shouted. I don't know, said my ma. I have no idea. My granny told me, come here, and I went and stood in front of the two of them. My granny loomed over me at that age. She was a massive personality. I was riddled with more anxiety in her presence than any teacher I had through school. I didn't ever really talk to her, but it felt like this had to be said. So you don't think your ma loves you? She asked me. I shook my head. How no, son? Well, she, she never tells me that she loves me. She never cuddles me or anything. My ma laughed again here. You never tell me that you love me, she said. But I, know, I still know you do. I just didn't know how to like articulate it back then, but I felt as if she should be telling me that she loved me. I shrugged my wee shoulders. Right, we're going to take you to the hospital then. Come on, my granny said, getting up off the couch. How? What, what for? Why? I asked. I felt a big lump rising my throat as if it came all the way from my toes. Because there must be something wrong with your brain if you don't think your ma loves you, Jamie. Aye, said my ma, chiming in. you need an operation. Maybe a brain transplant, I think. I started greeting then, I remember. My granny said, come here, again. But no, in the angry way she'd said it before, it was all drawn out and nice. I moved closer to her and she grabbed me. As my granny held me tight into her, I looked at my ma. All I wanted her to say was, I love you, or join in and we'd have a big cuddle together like I'd seen American families do in films. All she offered me was a wee smile. She sat back and started reading her magazine. I love you, my granny said into my ear. And so does your ma, your granda and all. Everybody, it's all right, it's all right. They might not say it, <clears throat> they might not say it, but they do. Now we go and play a wee game. I pulled away from her embrace. I'd left a big white mark down her top. I'm sorry, I said, and I went back to playing Pokemon. My ma just winked at me. She never ever said I love you, even after that day. My dad would say it to me, but he never needed prompting. It'd normally be after a few cans. That's why I always liked when he had a drink, I think. He finished work early, but he'd be home later than he normally would, because he'd head to the pub for a drink. My ma always seemed more uptight on a Friday, more snappy and naggy than normal. She'd say things like, this needs to be done before your dad gets home, while she scrubbed the toilet or washed the windows or whatever, doing pure trivial, non-essential cleaning stuff that could wait. Who actually cared if your windows were clean or no, but she'd be stressed out of box, running about daft about the house, cloths and bottles of cleaning stuff everywhere, the house reeking of air freshener and bleach, and every surface sanitised and gleaming, not even a single pube on the toilet floor. I loved when my dad came home from the pub. That smell of fags and lager on his breath felt so smoothing. Like the way that aromatherapy carry-on works for women. Smelly candles and that to make them more relaxed and chilled out. The smell of my dad after the pub did the same for me. It was always more of a laugh after he'd been to the pub and had had a few pints. It was more funny. He'd say something cheeky to my ma and then turn to me and make a face and it would always make me laugh. If he had cans in the, if he had cans in the house though, they would get moody and I'd get sent up the stair by my ma. I never understood why until I was older. I had this book I used to read when I was around that age too. It was called The Encyclopedia of the Unexplained. It was a big heavy hardback, so heavy I could hardly lift it when I was a wee guy. It scared me to death, this book. The front cover was an aerial photograph of a supposed sea monster. It was a tiny fishing boat on a blue sea, but underneath was this big black mass Bigger than any whale or squid or anything like that. Just some mad huge creature from the bottom of the ocean. 
inside it in the sea monster section, it suggested either something it was either something like Loch Ness Monster or some giant undiscovered jellyfish. Either way, it was terrifying. The whole book was, to be fair. But the scariest bit was the ghost section. That's the one that gave me actual chills and made me shake with fear whenever I read it. The sea monster stuff was scary, aye, but sea creatures are easily avoided, aren't they? Just don't go in the sea and you'll be fine. But ghosts, they can get you anywhere. The book had these horrible wee drawings of supposed ghost sightings from the olden days, right through to black and white pictures and then more recent ones as well. The drawings were scary because everybody in them had their faces all contorted, mouths hanging open, eyes pure white, clearly screaming. There were these pictures of folk with ectoplasm coming out of their mouths and draped all over them, this sticky white fluid floating through the air and covering people. Apparently it came from ghosts. It's funny now, looking back, I suppose, but back then I'd be sitting in my room at night, hands absolutely trembling while I, tr while I tried to hold the book and look at it closer, desperate to pull my eyes away, knowing fine well that I'd be unable to sleep for the bad dreams and the thought that there was obviously ghosts in my house who were going to shower me with their ectoplasm. But there was one section of the book that I only went near if I was feeling really brave. And that was normally only during the day I was able to read it, because obviously, as everybody knows, ghosts can't hurt you during the day. It was this two-page spread right in the middle of the ghost section, and it was all about poltergeists. I started off by saying that poltergeist means noisy ghost in German. I'd heard there was films about them in the video shop near our house, but the book scared me enough. Watching the video would probably have killed me, gave me a heart attack or something. This wee section went on and on about how these ghosts could hurt you, and how it would feel like biting and pinching and kicking. It said as well that they were capable of moving objects and furniture around, and that if you had a poltergeist in your house, you'd definitely know about it. I was so sure we had one. Occasionally during the week, but always or every Friday night, I would hear banging and I could hear my mom crying. Surely, I thought, the telltale signs of having a poltergeist. I'd hear a plate smashed against a wall or something heavy being flung, doors banging, and my mum sobbing her heart out, my dad shouting. I didn't know why they didn't just come away, come up the stair away from the thing. I went down once during the night to suggest that they should do that after the banging and greeting had been going on for hours and I couldn't sleep. I opened the living room door just a wee bit and I heard, go back up the stair, Jamie, from my mom. The big light was on, which was weird as my mom never put that on. The living room looked dead different under its horrible yellow glow. It made everything look dead sickly and cheap and no nice. It all went quiet in the living room until I went back up to my room. It was only a few years ago that I realised the Friday night poltergeist I'd been so scared of was actually my own dad. Cheers. Oh, it's got a, a killer ending that the, the Friday night poltergeist was actually my own dad from, da from uh, that character in that book. And it's amazing the way it takes you really back into the, the sensibility of a child, the kind of ways, the kind of fears that you have. And the way, so as a child, you really pick up on atmospheres, but might actually attribute them to other things. That's one of the things I wanted to do, because a lot of the book is kind of flashbacks to the wee boy, the wee boy Jamie's childhood, and um, you know how he remembers them at the time, and how he remembers them now he's a wee bit older, and then um, he's got kind of a wee bit more life experience, and how those memories, you know, they're, they're sort of faded over the years, they sort of change, and they become almost false, you know, you start to misremember things, and how that's affected him growing up and how he blames his parents for the way it is when, you know, in a lot of ways that's not really the case, you know, and um, it's quite, it's quite complicated looking at the relationship between him and his mum and his estranged dad, that kind of disappears later in the book. Um, so, uh, it's been, it's been really good because I, norm I normally write, um, like kind of comedy and like kind of daft, kind of slapstick stuff, which I love doing, but I've really enjoyed getting my teeth into this and writing something a wee bit, um, a wee bit, darker and heavier and a bit more emotional as well it's been it's been good yeah because it is it is dark compared to something like the karma police or or some of your playful stories that still take a slightly sinister idea but are so funny that and, and they play around with, with humor still humor on the dark side of things but humor nonetheless and do you think that maybe living through this particular crisis and maybe coming back to glasgow recently has influenced how you're are you thinking about this novel? That not necessarily that you'll have the crisis in it, but that it somehow feeds in the atmosphere. Um, I I think so. I was talking to you about this the other day. Um, I've I've me and my girlfriend. We've been up at um, her parents in Dunblane. Um, we were up there like in a weekend before lockdown was announced, and when lockdown happened, we thought we'll probably better just 
staying up here in Dunblane out in the countryside. And um, so we stayed there for a few months and we came back came back to Glasgow last week and it was so strange. Like up in Dunblane, you know, it's out in the countryside and there's not really much happening there. So it just every day just felt almost like a like a bank holiday, you know, everybody was off work and it was sunny and everybody's out on bikes and out running and stuff and it felt really nice and then coming back to Glasgow, like just a there's a really weird atmosphere kind of hanging over the city. Um, I was driving, we stay in uh, flats and when I was driving down the main roads, like all the shops are shut up and there's big COVID-19 stickers on them. Uh, all the pubs, all the windows have, have been boarded up and there's people queuing and just a, a really, really strange atmosphere. It kind of feels like the start of a, a film about the end of the world, you know what I mean? And, uh, it's really odd. Um, I don't know, I've been kind of Thinking about my novel a lot, I've been writing wee bits of it during lockdown, it's been kind of hard to concentrate, but um, I've been doing my best and um, I was thinking, you know, maybe, I don't know, would the kind of coronavirus crisis, maybe that could feed into the novel, but I don't know. But I think, like you say, this kind of weird atmosphere that's settled over the city, it's kind of, it's horrible, it's, it's kind of inspired my writing and I'm kind of looking at ways to build that kind of sense of dread into the book by you know, kind of studying how people are acting. Just now, you know, everybody's kind of edgy and staying away from each other in the shop. And um, it's just bizarre. It's just such a, a strange, strange time. It's so weird. It's so odd. Uh, and, and your character is a hermit and is uh, becomes a, a hermit and is used to being isolated and estranged and apart um, from from his family, presumably. Um, so that sense of estrangement is there in the very theme of your book and, this, and the sense of being separate. And did, did you have a sense of being separate growing up yourself in Glasgow or, or not? Did you feel part of, of the city? Um, I, I was quite lucky when I was younger. I had loads of pals and then like, where I stayed in, in the East End, like everybody like my age would just always out playing. You know, I mean, you go out in the morning and you get told, you know, come home at night once the streetlights come on. And it was just, it was nice. You know I mean, everybody's just out playing and it just felt dead safe. Um, as I got a wee bit older into high school and stuff, I kind of stopped getting out a wee bit. And um, I don't know, I wouldn't say I, I became a hermit, but I was, I like to, I like to stay in. Um, <laughs> um, but I have, I have always felt, I felt like a part of Glasgow, I think. Just the people that are inspires my writing. Everybody's just, like, I love sometimes just going to the pub myself and just sitting listening to conversations, just trying to get a bit of inspiration for my luck. Um, just, I think, Glaswegians are just natural storytellers. Um, like I was saying about my family, like, at any pub you'll find some guy who's got a story to tell. And I love just going and trying to find that guy and, you know, tell me your story, mate, what's the script? And, and just the way they tell it, they're just, it's like they've told these stories so many times. It's like a stand-up routine. I just I love just sitting, drinking it in. I love it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's something that you, you and Peter have in common, this love of language and how alive it is, the, the language of, of, of childhood, but also the language of the present. It's really, really lively. It jumps straight off, off the page. And I think that, that, that it's interesting that we're connected to live language and, and to the and to tradition of, of language um, being handed down. It's a, it's a really interesting thing, but your, your language is very muscular and, and, uh, and that the voice of that child comes just right off, right off the page there. At this point, I'd like to um, bring uh, Peter and uh, Suzanne um, back in to the room because I thought I'd read you another poem that's really been in uh, the reason that I'm reading it is been inspired by your choices of readings tonight and this is a uh, called Old Tongue and uh, I wrote this for uh, Caroline Duffy because she left Glasgow when she was eight and then really missed the words missed the way that she'd she'd talked so uh, this is called old tongue. It's interesting though, everybody always assumes that the I voice in the poem has to be yours, but it's not. <laughs> anyway, so this is, this is old tongue. When I was eight, I was forced south. Not long after, when I opened my mouth, a strange thing happened. I lost my Scottish accent. Words fell off my tongue. Egypt, drich, wabbit, crabbit, stumer, chuchter, heatbanger. So you are, so am I, see you, see mama, 
shut your geggy, I'll give you the milky. My own vowels started to stretch like my bones and I turned my back on Scotland. Words disappeared in the dead of night. New words marched in, ghastly, awful, quite dreadful. Scones said like stones, pokey hats into ice cream cones. Oh, where did all my words go? My old words, my lost words. Did you ever feel sad when you lost a word? Did you ever try and call it back, like calling in the sea? If I could have found my words wandering, I swear I would have taken them in, swallowed them whole, knocked them back. Out in the English soil, my old words buried themselves. It made my mother's blood boil. I cried one day with the wrong sound in my mouth. I wanted them back. I wanted my old accent back, my old tongue, my dour, sour Scottish tongue. Sing, songy. I wanted to get laldy. So, yeah, I like the shut your giggle, I'll give them alky. <laughs> 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 I remember people used to actually say that and it is, it is funny isn't it the way that some, some expressions just take you straight back to a particular time in a particular place and how so much perhaps our, our love of, of language and of, of song is rooted in, in childhood wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree Peter? Absolutely and I think that there's particular words from childhood like even just ove ove hi hi being told off that they've got a resonance and go somewhere deep inside you still that the and especially words of, of threat they can get get deep inside you still into places you didn't know still existed that's great well you're going to read now a really fantastic poem um you're in for a real treat here and uh, oral history it's such a, a moving poem and you, you get such a sense of the characters in the poem too so take it away Patrick. I'm really jealous of Chris, who's such a fantastic storyteller. And for me, it, it takes an age to get to the end of a story or to tie it up. So I struggle with that. But I knew lots of fantastic storytellers when I was a child. And as a primary school kid, we were sent to record them. Oral history. When we stopped recording, you carried on telling tales unsuitable for our primary school years about the evacuees to the islands during World War II, wilder than you could imagine, damaged about the time the whole damn church spoke in tongues except you and thank God your husband and neither of you ever went back. About the aisle layer and not talking about the aisle layer. About scrabbling around after cows and sheep most of your life from shore to shilling, from dirt to dirt. About how it wasn't rightly safe for girls to go to the moor by themselves. About how hellish, much worse than you imagined, life could be about how age had swollen up your ankles and swallowed all your grace, taken away your light stepping to the shore. And even after we had packed up the equipment, gone back to our primary schools, colleges, studios, had aged and married and died like you yourself, you went on talking, words settling in the plywood and furniture dust, the antimacassars and service clothes pressed and far too small for you now in mothballs and never to be opened drawers that were ploughed into the soil you married into, along with the poured concrete, corrugated iron, scullery stones, subterranean passage, damp flecked wallpaper and beds and chairs and mirrors saved for, carted across the moor from Stornoway and then left to settle into disuse and rot until the digger knocked and flattened the lot in exchange for the dry stone wall you'd inherited, the mirrors as shiny and warped as ever, giving a thousand reflections of the ploughed earth. Words that now jostle and elbow each other, unsettling the sand in your coffin, and seep through the soil and doubt to drift on the macher winds, murmuring and grumbling on, having their own say, eh, eh, until the break of day like two young rows feeding among the lilies. And I think there's fantastic about the way that language tends to be excessive, to go beyond your ability to control it. You can never quite put what you want to into words. Language will find its own way. And so I'm interested in the concept of logaria, when you just talk too much and words and words come pouring out of you, especially when you're in love. 
Rogeria. Betukelor moike, drar wel mar irklisch, in gauri gormio es moel, rivinog. In ruminam ergiens gene fer polog fer kujoch, fin a tarkshin gut gel maranoch, an arch in Rogeria. Als in es a magelic chele, mar pochor as mar betuol, get a hat a hollish nam speren, a wanderer harchul. Rogeria. You are the gold love of my youth. You are laugh love like the northern lights. In the blue Lewis winter, my love, my young love. If I were a troubadour and not a blunderer and a fool, I'd have given you everlasting love instead of logeria. And now my love is another as is right, as should be. But your lights are still in my skies, glittering across the Kyle. Wow. I love those two poems. They're just just crackers. Really, so much so much to say um, about them. Really, really wonderful. I love the idea that she continues to have her language long after she's dead, in all of her different ways, and the ways in which that terrible disaster that haunted Lewis for ages is also there in the poem from the from the First World War. That that idea of the of the dead shoring up and coming right into your shore. Um, and, and, and it taking generations and generations of people to try and deal with it and cope with it. I think one of the important things is to remember that the voices from the past, the voices from the dead, can resonate so much. They can be soulful, they can be heartfelt, they can be rude, they can be angry, they can be sexy, they can be all of these different things and they can be surprising. And it, it, I think in some ways it's it's easy to be pious about the past and there are lots of parts of the past we definitely should not be pious about. There are definitely lots of the past where we should be listening to the voices that haven't been heard and voices that, um, certainly the women of Lewis, were these great, strong, fantastic tradition bearers. I remember from my childhood all of the women of the village and how sharp they were, how gear, how, how interesting they were. But most of these voices never found their way, say, into the songs that would get sung or the tales that got told. And trying to remember a bit of that, I think, is hugely important. Absolutely. And that logoria I found, I found fascinating, too, because I remember learning the word loquacious from Anne of Green Gables <laughs> when I was 11 and then going around to saying to everybody, I'm very loquacious, I'm very loquacious. And my mum would go, I, you're a blether of hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I like the fact that there was a word, you know, leather um, and loquacious. And then, and then there's logoria, which has got a kind of a strange, a strange rhyme with a sexual disease. <laughs> but um, but I, I love the, the idea that as, as this young, young man thinking to his, to his past love and to thinking of how, how things might have been done differently. To be honest, leather is such a better word for it than logeria. I think they're just when when you talk and talk and talk because you can't quite say what you want or the the emotions seem to be excessive to the to the language that you have, which. Well, what is logeria in Gaelic, by the way? Uh, <laughs> I can't think of anything that wouldn't require a strong language warning in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so when you translated that poem, you had to go for an entirely different route. I, I, I just kept the, 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 the nice standard logeria. I borrowed it from the language. Oh, I see. That's great. Oh, that's yeah. great. Well, well, this is interesting about the nearness and the farness of, of language that, that some words are up against us and some words we actually have to just, they have to have a dual purpose, don't they? They, they appear into the, into the Gaelic, the, the certain English words or even certain American words, or certain German words, and that that's, that's what we have and that language is a, is a real um, melting pot and it, it fascinates me it's the same with, 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 with song in so many ways that some of our traditions from jazz and blues songs come from other traditions previous to that from work songs or the equivalent of walking songs that we heard you sing a walking song earlier so, so Suzanne you've got a, a completely different song now to sing from the great American song book can you tell us a little bit about it and then just take it away Yes, it's a song called The Nearness of You and it was um, penned by Hoagie Carmichael. And what I think is amazing about these songs is that they're, they're you know, writers from cities. And when you think of what we've been talking about, we've been talking about islands and land and so that you can write such beauty 
in the city as well. The nearness of you. It's not the pale moon that excites me or thrills or delights me. Oh no, it's just the nearness of you. It isn't your sweet conversation that thrills this sensation. Oh no, it's just the nearness of you. When you're in my arms and I hold you close to me, all my wildest dreams come true. I need no soft light to enchant me if you will only grant me the right to hold you ever so tight and to feel in the the nearness of you, the nearness of you. Oh, that was so so beautiful, Suzanne. Absolutely fantastic, and and it makes you it makes you think. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful love song, but it also makes you think of what is near uh, to you, yeah. the nearness of you, and really of the of, of the other self that we have, the nearness of our of our child self. It makes you it takes you off in all sorts of different directions. That song. Yes, and my daughter Marissa, she loves it so. Um, it's one that she said, please, please, can you sing? So um, she's back, which is, is gorgeous to have her back. I've missed her so much. So for all the, the mothers out there and fathers and, you know, for people that are missing relatives. And um, I think that's what's so important, isn't it? These feelings that we hold and that um, I hope soon people will be reunited. And for those that have lost as well, you know, it's, it's um, we're, all, we're all there in spirit with you. Oh, that was beautifully put. Well, I'm going to bring Chris and Peter back into the into the room. And do you feel? I mean, did you having having Marissa yourself? Does it take you back to your childhood, Suzanne? Having a child, you know, sometimes being a parent can take you re magic key, and it takes you straight back to your own childhood. Yes, it does, and it's funny. You've got to think, remind yourself with with youth too. I think there can be, um, you know, like a um not anger but passion you know about social injustice with youth it's like matthew you know has so respect and um, amazing what he contributes to society and all that he does and um i've got to remind myself i used to be that person more it turns into a slightly more gentle <laughs> meander through for me now so um but it reminds me of myself how i used to be and and um, when i see her and you know that she supports many causes and has a, a really strong social conscious and just lots of wee things that um and it makes you think also um god if i'd known then what i know now that is the you know the thing that's tricky but you wouldn't be we wouldn't be who we we are if we if we um if we'd got it all right then <laughs> no, absolutely yeah. and and do you feel you have exact access to the the wee boy that you were patrick do you do you remember him what What's near to him about you? 
I no, I, I think one of the difficulties with especially with the young child is trying to remember the fear and love and how everything was excessive and how everything could just throw you off balance. Um and probably I'm a bit too too sane now for that, just to have the, the sense of the the, the the full possibility of childhood, but also the, the ruptures of childhood, the the chaos that it, you could face. And the intensity of it. What about you, Chris? Do you do you feel that you're linked? Do you feel that maybe being a writer actually allows you to remember your childhood differently or, or better or more vividly? Do you feel that you've you've got kind of a, a special access to it, a little door that's that's left open? Because I suppose as writers you're still doing a, a childlike activity to some way. We're still all just making things up. <laughs> that's what we're that's what we're doing for the living. We're just making things up. <laughs> And that's what you did as a child, you just made things up. So, so, so sometimes when I meet writers, I often think, you know, you can see, even, even when I meet writers, 80-year-old men or something, you know, when I meet someone like Sorley McLean or, or Norman McCaig, I, I could glimpse or see quite easily uh, the wee boy in them. And I think, that, I think I might not have been able to see that so easily had they not been writers. What do you think, Chris? I, I think so. Um, it's why the things like I, I draw for my childhood for most of my work, and I always think... You know, if I'm stuck for ideas, I was trying to think, you know, what kind of mad things happened when I was younger? Or what's the kind of mad stories I heard from my family or my pals? What were the kind of, what kind of tales for the area that I grew up or the kind of up in myths and the mad kind of legend stuff? And I love thinking back on it. And um, another, another thing about childhood is, like you're saying, about the kind of the intensity of feeling like a day. I, I kind of miss that because all your emotions, you feel them all so strongly when you're young. And everything's just so extreme, you know. When something sad happens, it's just it's the worst thing ever and you're just totally abjectly sad and and when you're happy you're the happiest you've ever been and it's just it's it's unbelievable so I like to try and think back to how strong those feelings used to be because it kind of I don't know it kind of gets ground out you a wee bit you start to the extremes of feelings they're not as much as you get a wee bit older so I like to kind of tap back in you know what was it like at, you know at Christmas when I got that present that I always wanted like oh it was like winning the lottery do you know what I mean and try and draw for that and to, to describe feelings like people's my character's feelings that kind of draw you know, what were the extremes that I felt when I was younger and and this and this next piece that you're going to read actually takes us back to that kind of detailed looking at things that comes with being a child in a sense so I wonder if you could read snails for us please aye, 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 of course um, so this is a, wee, a story that I wrote although it's, it's more a um, conspiracy theory that I can I, I believe I, I genuinely believe this um, and I think as well, it probably comes from kind of misremembering my childhood. But um, anyway, this is, this is snails. So this is a conspiracy theory I wanted to share with folk for ages. And it's something that's been playing on my mind ever since I first snow saw a snail in real life. Now, honestly, right, hear me out, because yous are all complicit in this, in my opinion. Now, I never saw a snail in the flesh until I was 13. And you'll be sitting there going that to yourself, ah, this guy's talking mince, he's at it. But I remember, pure vividly, clear as day, watching a documentary when I was a wee boy about insects and all that, and the narrator saying, snails are only found in the south of the UK, where the climate is slightly warmer, but still wet enough for them. But you never used to get snails in Scotland until about 2004. Slugs, aye, fair enough, they've always been here, but no snails, and now they're everywhere just all of a sudden, and absolutely nobody is saying anything or batting an island. Now, when I was about four or five, I was massively into insects. I had wee toy ones, books about them, videos about them. I loved them, right? I could tell you facts about stag beetles, where you'd find the biggest moths in the world. I could name like 10 species of fly, and I even knew what food that worms like to eat best. I was an authority on creepy crawlies. And let me tell you this, you never used to get snails in Scotland, and that is a fact. Then when I was about 14, I was standing at my back door watching one of those mad torrential summer downpours. There was this wee concrete bit in my back garden and I looked over at it and it was just covered in snails. I shouted on my mom and my wee brother to come and see it and I was like, look, snails. And my mom went, oh cool, I didn't think you got snails in Scotland. I thought you only got them in England. Now I wish I had recorded her saying that on my old flip phone because now she says she never said that to me and that she's seen snails in Scotland since she was a wee lassie. My ma is a liar. 
Now, a lot of people will say I'm just misremembering things from my childhood. A lot of people will say I'm just being daft, but this is the hill that I will die on. So I read up online about other people saying things along the same lines as my snail nightmare. And there's this phenomenon called the Mandela effect. Now, it's called this because apparently loads of people say they remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison in the 1980s. And they even remember watching his funeral on the telly. Now, there's people that swear that sex and the city used to be called sex in the city. I know a couple of people who've claimed Scots porridge oats used to be spelled on the box as Scots porridge oats. So they claim, so as it is on the box, it's P-O-R-A-G-E. But people remember it as being spelled porridge, the way we normally spell porridge. Now, there's theories that say the Mandela effect is down to time travellers for the future, messing about with the past, or that people have somehow slipped from an alternate universe into our own. This is obviously just speculation and a kind of cool, daft idea that I am not some mad universe hopper. And I'm definitely no misremembering stuff either. I definitely did not see a snail until that rainy day when I was 14. I swear in my life. Now, it seems a bit weird to say that maybe it was just a weird quirk of fate that i never seen one if they had been here in Scotland the whole time. What would the odds be on not seeing a snail for the first 14 years of your life in a place where they've apparently always been common? What's the chances of not crossing past one for all that time? It must be billions to one. So this is Matthew. Yous are all just bamming me up. Yous are all just at the wind up. Maybe snails never used to be able to live in Scotland until global warming started coming into play. The climate here got a wee bit warmer and snails started spreading north of the border to get away from England. England. Who could blame them? And come up here because we are all dead sound. The French eat snails, so maybe the snails wanted to put a wee bit more distance between themselves and them. So maybe when I shouted on my mom to look at the snails for the first time, she then went away and told people that they'd always been here just to gaslight me. So you are all at it. My mom told one person, they told somebody else, and so on and so on, until everybody in my life, my pals, my family, strangers on the internet, and you watching this, these are all in on this big joke at my expense. Which you know what? Get up, you. Cheers. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. I just, I just love that. That's, and it fits so perfectly in a way with what we were talking about with the, the past and, and the present and with mythologizing and, and all sorts. It's just, it's just, just hilarious. Where did that come from, that idea? It's, it's true. I genuinely didn't see a snail until I was about 14. Wow. And I've, 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 I tell people this and they, they just look at me as if I'm at the wind up. And I'm like, I don't know how to prove it to you. I don't know how to prove it to you. Know, vivid memories of people saying to me, you don't get snails in Scotland, it's too cold. You only get them down south, it's a wee bit warmer, a wee bit well. <laughs> Losing my mind, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, well, talking about metaphors, it seems a funny idea that there's only snails in England. <laughs> <I know. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And I'd never heard about that Mandela effect before. I hadn't Actually, heard of it. It's really interesting. It's one of the things I, I read it and I was like, oh my God, there's loads of wee, loads of wee things. There's another one where it's, um, it was like in a cartoon series for the 80s and um, people remember it's being called the Berenstein Bells, but apparently it's always been the Berenstein Bells and loads of people swear, no, 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 it's always been Berenstein, like, but it's no, apparently it's no, it's always been Berenstein, so there's always be things that I don't know, it's like collective groups of people misremembering the same thing. I don't know, I don't know what happens, maybe they just repeat it and then it passes on and I don't know, it's strange, it's really interesting. Effect. It, it is, it's, it, it's really fascinating and also it reminds you of families at Christmas um, or, or thinking back to family Christmases or holidays where everybody's got a different version of the, the same event and everybody will actually say, no, no, that definitely happened at this and, <laughs> and uh and you just can't believe that somebody could possibly think that this happened instead of this when you think that this happened instead of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. The contested ground of, of memory is just something that probably interests us all. It's set to, interests you, doesn't it, Patrick? I know I distrust my memory at the best of times. So now I'm just ransacking my childhood to see what else I believe then that is no longer true. <laughs> That's true. Well, this has just been a fantastic, rich and heady mix of, of poetry, story, and song. It's been really fantastic having you all as my guest to Macro to Macro. So thank you very, very much, Patrick Mackay. Thank you very, very much, Chris McQueer. And thank you to our resident rotating singer, Suzanne Bonner. And um, we'll be back next time for 
Macro to Macro next week again, next Thursday at seven o'clock. But before we do so, I would love um, Suzanne just to announce who the next Macro is going to be. The next Macro is going to be the beautifully talented Adjoa Ando, and she'll be on next week. So tune in. <laughs> Fantastic. And I wonder, um, Patrick and Chris, if you could just both tell us a little line about your favourite independent bookshop. This is Independent Bookshop Week, so never been a better time to support independent bookshops. Uh, you I, jump. I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, so my, my favourite independent bookshop is uh, Golden Hair Books in Edinburgh. Um, just it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful wee shop, and um, they've got so many like good titles. Um, I just love it. The staff are all so nice, and it's just it's such a nice wee environment. Especially I love going to like, live events, and then I'm going in here and fill their offers. Um, uh, it's just it's a really magic wee shop. So I would, I would recommend everybody go and visit them. Yeah, it's a great choice. I love, I love Golden Hair as well. It's an absolutely beautiful shop. You're completely right, and something magical always happens whenever I'm in that shop. Something, some strange, bizarre coincidence happens, and it's just a really magic wee place. Yeah, what about you, Patrick? There are so many lovely wee bookshops in Edinburgh, but my favourite is um, No Alibi's Bookshop in Belfast. When I was working at the Shimasini Centre for Poetry there, the nearby bookshop is No Alibi's, which is a crime bookshop they've got a fantastic collection of crime fiction but they're incredibly supportive to poetry as well and have amazing really intimate events anytime you're in Belfast go and visit. Fantastic well that's a great choice as well and don't you find Belfast is very like Glasgow? Incredibly like Glasgow it's more or less that you could just put them to beside each other and walk from one to the other and it would make sense. Exactly. <laughs> well, well that, that's the way we've been trying to make sense of each other in this Zoom room tonight. We've put, our, we've put ourselves beside each other and we've walked from one room to the other, from my living room to your living room to your living room to your living room and to your at home's living room. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Macker to Macker. I want to thank all of our wonderful sponsors for making this happen, to the National Theatre of Scotland for hosting this and for helping to fund it, to Edinburgh International Book Fair, to Home Manchester and to the School of Arts and Media at the University of Salford. Thank you all very much. See you next week. Bye-bye.